I mean, Mayor Ted Wheeler to the microphone and go from there. Thank you, good sir. Good morning, everybody. It's Monday. Who has the first question? Alex. Hey, Alex. Good question. Um, so they are all still under consideration. My staff and I have been going through Commissioner Hardesty's proposals. We still have a number of questions about virtually all of them in terms of number one, what would be the impact on public safety if the reduction was taken? And number two, uh, how did they get the numbers that are on uh, that list of proposals? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, all of those are necessarily accurate. From a big picture perspective, uh, we all agree that investments in the community are a good thing, uh, whether it comes to education, housing, economic prosperity, investments in health care. Uh, we all understand that those kinds of things over the long term can improve public safety. My question in the near term, though, is whether or not taking cuts beyond the $27 million in cuts that have already been made to the police bureau enhance public safety. In other words, I believe that those community investments need to be in place and the public safety impact needs to be real before we start eliminating our capacity to respond to 911 calls. When people call 911 right now, they still expect a response. So I'll look at each and every one of those. Um, I'm not going to commit one way or the other right now, but I will say again that the bar for me is very high. First of all, uh, would taking those, you know, what impact would those reductions have on our staffing capacity at the Portland Police Bureau, and what would be the overall impact in terms of public safety, both in the near term and longer term. Okay. All right, next question. I guess it, I could have done Anyone that else? Well. Yeah, yeah, well, here I said I was gonna repeat the question and then I stepped away and left the mayor out here. I'll, I'll, I'll so, <laughs> go ahead, okay. Uh, Elise, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to get back to you because uh, I don't want to give you bad information. Um, Jim, can we make sure we follow up? But, but I believe a number of the nonprofit service providers that we're working with would also allow people to get them in person. I believe that's the case, but I want to follow up and make sure that's accurate. There are, Do you, there are 35 nonprofit organizations that are all service right now, right. and there are other situations where people find out that they So, Jim, if somebody doesn't have access to the internet, can they still get one of those cards through the nonprofit providers? Okay, good. There's there's your answer on that one. But the, the 2800 are through United Way. And right. the, yeah, uh, those are the online. That's the number of online. Because yeah, I know the majority of them are already people who are connected with services and can get in those. But yeah, that was just some, some questions for that people ask. For. Yeah, and and United Way is just one of the service partners. There's there's many many others. Well, uh, the, the data speaks for itself. The vast, you know, the, the homeless are significantly overrepresented amongst the arrest data. Um, the report that was compiled by the Oregonian draws a very logical conclusion that the way that you reduce homelessness and also reduced recidivism amongst those who happen to be homeless is through housing. 
and support. And that's been uh, the effort that this administration has undertaken aggressively, is to increase the units of zero income or low income housing. In fact, uh, during my stewardship of the Portland Housing Bureau, we've produced thousands of units of low income housing. Uh, in fact, it's a record for the Portland Housing Bureau. Uh, we have promises that are now being kept, in fact, exceeded around the Portland housing bond. I went to bat for, along with a lot of other people in this region, for the uh, Metro Regional Housing Bond, which will help combine services with the housing infrastructure that we're putting in place. Um, so all, you know, this may be an area, area where Sarah and I are in agreement in terms of diagnosing the problem and understanding what has to happen. The question I would have in the near term is what do we do about public safety on our streets? And my conclusion has been that we need to be much more aggressive as a city, as a county, and as a region in getting as many people as quickly and humanely off the sidewalks as possible. We also uh, agree that we don't necessarily want the police to be the first responders showing up every time there's an issue with somebody who's in crisis. And a lot of the calls we get, people call 911, they say there's somebody uh, who's on the street and they're acting out in some particular way, um, please send somebody. Right now that somebody is the police. And even the police agree that they are not necessarily the right people to show up for those kinds of interventive calls when there's somebody in crisis. And that's why I have supported, uh, and my colleagues on the Portland City Council have supported increasing the funding for the Portland Street Response that would send an EMT and a mental health worker into the community to do a non-police intervention when there's somebody in crisis on the streets. All, all of those are the right strategies. So I'm, I'm going to make Jim's head spin around because um, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. I think that the steps we're taking are demonstrably the right ones. Create more housing opportunities, create more support opportunities for people to be successful in that housing, whether it's connection to job training or substance abuse treatment or mental health services. The problem is it's not up to the scale of the problem. For 10 years in this community, we were effectively building no additional housing during the Great Recession, and yet we were still attracting a lot of high-skilled, high-wage workers. Uh, we were still seeing an expansion of our innovation and technology economy here in the city of Portland. And what we saw was people who've lived here for a long time who are not necessarily high-skill, high-wage workers were being displaced due to the lack of housing stock and the influx of people coming in with higher skills and higher wages. We are somewhere in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of units short. There are neighborhoods in this community that the average black family cannot afford to live in. And there's no neighborhood in this, in this city that the average black family based on income can afford to live in. So what I would propose going forward, and I'm not establishing a policy today, but I'm establishing an aspirational strategy. We need a moonshot when it comes to low income and affordable housing in this community to address the homeless crisis on our streets. We have sources of funding that are already in place, whether it's the housing bond, whether it's the regional housing bond. I would simply ask us a question, and the question is this. What would it take for the public sector, meaning the city, Portland, Multnomah County, the metro regional government, potentially Washington and Clackamas counties, what it would it take for us in partnership with the private sector 
to build 5,000 units of low-income housing in this community in three years. And to get there, in other words, what rules, what regulations, what fees, what impediments could we just flat out eliminate on an emergency basis with the goal being to get 5,000 units of housing in place quickly for those who desperately need to get off the streets. That's the upstream intervention that, along with investing in things like non-law enforcement responses to those who are homeless on the streets who may be in crisis, those are the things that will ultimately reduce the number of arrests. It, it's absolutely on the table. We, you know, the, the Housing Bureau, uh, Prosper Portland, uh, all of our city bureaus, certainly my administration, we're trying to be as flexible and innovative as possible. And we're doing things that we didn't think four years ago we would be doing, including expanding managed camps in the central city, that kind of thing, in response to the COVID crisis. Or you know, I don't know that we've ever opened 300 or 275 beds of new shelter over a period of weeks just through sheer will and redirecting resources as quickly as we can to make it happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's critically important. I think we're going to keep moving forward. I think we need to look at every opportunity to build more of that housing stock here in the community. So the Portland Street response uh, has been well funded. Um, you know, I, as a co-champion of that, I actually increased the funding in my base budget, in my proposed budget, uh, during the recent round of reallocating dollars from the police bureau to the community. There were additional dollars put into the street response. I believe that line item is now about five million. I have a concern that those resources will not be fully deployed by the end of the budget cycle. And so the, the, uh, the, the back and forth I've been having with Commissioner Hardesty and the Bureau of Emergency Management and the Fire Bureau is what is the right amount of funding for them to be able to actually spend it during the fiscal year and how quickly can they bring that program online? You know, Commissioner Hardesty is directing that work. She is setting the pace for how quickly dollars are absorbed and how quickly the program comes online. Uh, I want to continue to support them, but I also don't want to simply allocate dollars into a reserve account when it could be going towards rent support or other immediate COVID relief. So that's the question uh, that we're still banding about as a council. We'll get to you in a minute. We got Maggie Vespa on the phone here, right here. So Maggie, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, before I forget, I wanted to make sure we got her in. And we'll get right back. Hi, Maggie. Okay, could, could you all hear that question? Let me repeat the question, and Maggie, I'll, I'll, I'll do my level best to do it on her. So Maggie asked the question. Um, she's referencing some tweets that have been sent out. The, questions, uh, the question is, what are we telling the business community and others about our plans and our level of preparedness for any potential violence or disruption during the upcoming election? Maggie, is that a fair Restatement of your question? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. So she says that's a fair restatement of her question. So several weeks ago, I stood here at this podium and I said that what we need to be fully prepared uh, for any potential violence or other disruptions on election night is strong mutual aid agreements in place with our federal, our state, and our local law enforcement partners. And we've been meeting since that time. 
Uh, I had a meeting uh, over the phone as recently as yesterday afternoon with the governor. We're in discussions about what that template mutual aid agreement would look like for the elections upcoming. Uh, the governor has put some asks on the table. I've put some asks on the table. The federal government will undoubtedly put some asks on the table. And the goal is for all of us to move a little bit, for all of us to compromise a little bit, so that we can have a solid mutual aid agreement that we all agree to in advance, so that we are all on the same page and we won't have to stop and have discussions or deliberations about whose policies or whose directives are in effect and whose are not. And everything is on the table in these discussions from the use of uh, crowd dispersal techniques to the question of federal deputization to the role of state versus county versus local law enforcement questions about indemnification are on the table and questions about economic reimbursement for costs incurred. That's also on the table. We're pretty far down the road on these discussions and my expectation is that we'll be making an announcement in the next day or two about specifically what the plan is and what the agreement is with regard to interagency cooperation. And I, I don't know if that'll come out of our office or out of the governor's office or jointly. We, we haven't really discussed that yet. As you're aware, um, the governor and the state police are not willing to participate in mutual aid if CS gas isn't on the table as a viable option. The federal government and local law enforcement have a philosophical agreement around deputization, but as the elected official who is responsible for the oversight of the Portland Police Bureau, I want more specifics and I want a very clear understanding of what deputization means, under what circumstances it would be utilized, and I want it to have a time certain expiration at the end of the event. Um, and the preliminary conversations I've had with the governor lead me to believe that the event would be defined as the duration of an emergency declaration coming out of the office of the executive. Um, I, I can't off the top of my head, so I could get back to you on that question. Um, I, I'm sure there was a good budgetary reason for it. I just can't, I, I don't know right now. So let me get back to you unless, Jim, if you know. Sonia, do you have a sense on that? Could, could you repeat the question? Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll make sure we get back to you on that today. So we, we have a new source of revenues coming online, which is, of course, the Here Together dollars, which I and many other people advocated for passage back in May. Those dollars will be coming online sometime over the course of this next year, potentially as early as this spring. Those dollars will be collected by Metro Regional Government. They will be distributed through the three counties on a formula basis. What I'd like to do is have some conversations with Chair Kafori and other county commissioners, as well as our Housing Bureau, 
and others and talk about how we can maximize those dollars, how we can leverage them. I believe that we need to make a sizable investment and a quick investment in getting people off the streets. I you know, philosophically don't believe that's a humane solution, particularly during the winter. Uh, shelter is a better option if it has access to hygiene and heat and it's dry and there's food and potentially connections to service. But what was, what's well known and what was highlighted in the Oregonians article this, this weekend was that housing remains paramount. And we have a dire shortage of low income and workforce housing in this community. So my question is, while we are here in a housing crisis, in a COVID crisis, while we are in a state of declared emergency, are there things that I can do as mayor under this declared emergency that combines some of those resources or the anticipation of those resources, because you can bond against anticipated revenues, and work with private sector partners to leverage the heck out of those dollars to build a lot of units of low income and workforce housing. And um, you know, we, we had an opportunity that was missed by the legislature in the last couple of days when they decided not to make a sizable investment in purchasing underutilized hotels and motels. They, I, I was grateful that they did it in areas impacted by forest fires, but anybody who walks out in front of City Hall sees we have a withering problem here as well. So I believe there are, there are rules, there are regulations that we could disband during this time of crisis for this specific purpose of building some large number of low-income housing units in this community. And I would argue that with the resources we have coming in, the question I would ask isn't why don't we? My question is what would it take to build 5,000 units or be on track to build 5,000 units, have them committed and in the chain within a three-year period? What rules? What regulations? What fees? What partnerships? Could we engage in with the private sector, with nonprofit housing providers and others to bring to bear the largest number of low income housing units this city has ever brought online? We have an opportunity here, uh, and I think we should at least look at that aggressively. We should give it a good hard tire kick and ask ourselves aspirationally what would it take to get it done? Because I believe we can do it. And I'm hearing from, you asked, what am I hearing from the private sector? Uh, what I'm hearing from them is they're eager. Uh, they, there are construction crews that are becoming idle in this time. There are assets that are available in the market at reduced rates as a result of, of the, the current state of the economy under this COVID crisis. And we all know that this is a collaboration. It requires collaboration. So I'm just asking if we got a bunch of people in the room, public, private sector, nonprofit partners, and asked ourselves, what would it take with the resources we have to build 5,000 units in three years? Could we do it? And what would it take to do it? So the, the intended goal here, first of all, let, let me step back and just say, uh, during this budget cycle, during the direction that I gave a year ago, I asked that all of our public safety bureaus, so predominantly fire, police, the Bureau of Emergency Communications, and the Bureau of Emergency Management, I asked them to work together and find me constraint savings through combining effectively back office operations, administration, finance, budgeting, 
um, public relations, systems, anything they could do to combine their resources. The next step is talking about how do you rationalize the public safety system. Right now, the way it works is people bring individual ideas to city council. And they say, well, I'd like to cut this program or I'd like to expand that program. But then we never stop and take a look at how does a change, for example, in one bureau's budget impact the operational needs of another bureau's budget. Um, many cities around the country have public safety directors to coordinate these efforts. The public safety director doesn't necessarily call the shots within each of those bureaus about how resources are deployed or operationally how those bureaus are managed, but it would provide that large oversight, that strategic planning, the visioning, the right sizing between different bureaus, and that's what's currently lacking in the way we manage public safety. It's not that people aren't engaged in that process, but there's nobody who is singularly, relentlessly focused on those larger strategic questions on an ongoing basis. And Commissioner Hardesty and I did some scoping early on with the fire chief, the police chief, um, and we all came to the conclusion that there's a there there, that this is worth pursuing, that there are opportunities to better align our public safety resources, and so that's what we're intending to do. And, and I would actually argue the timing is, is very important right now because we, we, you know, I'm still holding police and fire to their constraint reductions you know, for, for the next fiscal year, not just this fiscal year, but next fiscal year potentially is gonna be a rough year uh, as well. And so I, I, I want us to think as smartly as we can running out of time here, so I'll get your last couple of questions in, please. Uh, uh, there are a lot of proposals on the table with the local fire, and the EPA buy-in. I'm wondering if you've done about the country that you're looking to get there. I hate to tell you this. I didn't hear a word of that. <laughs> oh. Sorry. There, there's like a fan or something right behind you. So uh, the question was, there's a lot of proposals on the table that would require police union buy-in. For example, the oversight and accountability measure that's been referred to the November ballot. Some of the work that we would like to do around the Portland Street response may require some additional uh, bargaining. Uh, and that's the answer. It just it requires us to identify potential areas of conflict. The Portland Police Association would certainly let us know and they would red flag anything that they believe is bargainable under our contract to the degree that we have agreement that certain issues are bargainable. We have a legal obligation and a moral obligation to bargain those issues in good faith with our labor union and that's what we'll do. I have not. I haven't had the chance to meet with the new president yet. So generally speaking, um, and, and I, I want to be clear, um, just so there's no mistake, I am not today committing to 5,000 more units of affordable housing. I'm saying if we all get in a room and ask ourselves what would it take, I believe what it would take is a much faster permitting process, a truly fast-tracked, streamlined permitting process. I believe we would need to waive significant fees that we currently charge. I believe that we would need to talk about how to uh, move those permits to the front of the line so that on questions of architecture or questions or engineering that we accept under those standards uh, the engineering stamps from firms that are certified and licensed here in the state of Oregon instead of doing our own 
follow-ups. Uh, I'm just saying, what would it take for that, for those specific units that we are trying to build to just blue sky it and say if our only objective is to quickly, efficiently, and affordably build as many of these units as we possibly can in the near term, what would that look like? What if we were starting from scratch? As opposed to the way we often do it now, which is we start with a number, which is actually the core construction cost, the engineering cost, the siting cost, and then we say, well, but you have this regulatory overlay and this overlay, and then you have to you know, pay these fees and those fees, and what I'm hearing, and then you have to have certain follow-up inspections, and what I'm hearing from people who provide these houses in other jurisdictions around the state and around the nation that it is very, very difficult and expensive to build them here, and therefore it is also difficult to finance them here. And what I don't want to do is talk about a bunch of reasons why it can't be done. I want to turn the frame of the conversation on its head and talk about what will it take to get it done. And then let's have an honest conversation with the community. It, it may mean that there are certain things we currently charge fees for that we will not be charging fees for. It may mean there are certain uh, environmental overlays that people have long supported here, but maybe in the interest of getting people in housing quickly and affordably, maybe for a specific portfolio of affordable housing units, we could do something different. And maybe there's ways during the actual construction process we could speed up the inspections. Uh, we're hearing a lot of stories still, particularly around COVID, about the difficulty of getting sites inspected. And they're inspected by different, uh, different bureaus that give conflicting advice. And those inspections can often take months to come to fruition. I'm, I'm hearing this from low-income housing developers all over the city. I'm hearing it from commercial developers as well. I think we can do better. Okay, one more question. This is the last one. We're beyond the bottom of the hour, so go ahead. What I said a few weeks ago, um, just as a reminder, is if we're talking about further budget cuts in addition to the $27 million, plus uh, next year there will be additional reductions just by virtue of the fact that all of our city bureaus next year are going to be under pressure to make further reductions, my question is for every single cut that is proposed, how does cutting or reducing a particular service or unit within the police bureau increase the public safety? And if I cannot answer that question, then I will not support that reduction. On the other hand, if somebody could argue that taking certain reductions in the police bureau and making investments in the community would immediately compensate for the lost police presence, I might well support that. In fact, I have supported reductions similar to that. But some of what people are asking us to do right now will actually cost more money. When people say they want police officers uh, to be better trained, that costs money. When people say they want more implicit bias or de-escalation training, there's a cost associated with that as well. I'm concerned about two metrics that are out there that are broadly available that are used by police bureaus to determine whether or not in the immediate term we have enough officers. One of those metrics is the number of officers per thousand population. We are low relative to other jurisdictions, substantially lower than some other neighboring jurisdictions, Seattle and San Francisco, for example. The other metric that's widely tracked is response time. And there has been a lot of criticism directed at the Portland Police Bureau for the slow response times to criminal activity. When people call 911 right now, 
they expect a police response. I agree that over the long term, it shouldn't always be a police response. And we've talked about some obvious examples, you know, mental health crises, uh, people who are suffering from, from substance abuse, uh, others living on our streets. I, I think we all agree that a police response is not always the best response. But if we cut the police response now, and we make an investment in the community that's not actually going to take hold for two or three or four years, my question is how does that make the, the public safer in the near term? It doesn't. So um, I don't want to get into a dynamic where um, we're potentially making short-term reductions in the Portland Police Bureau, hobbling our ability to respond to 911 calls without a clear path to how we are investing in the community to reduce the need for police in the first place. There, there needs to be some sort of a phasing of this process. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. I think that will wrap it up for us today. Thank you, everybody, for attending, for your thoughtful questions. Thank and you. We'll see you next time we do this. Appreciate it.